Hey everybody, this is Jordan Last. I would like to teach you some web development stuff. These video tutorials that I'm going to start doing are going to be pretty unedited, pretty raw. I feel like I've been wanting to do something like this for a long time, but I keep putting it off because I don't know, I want it to be perfect or I want to set it all up right. So I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to try to put content out there get some feedback and see if we can not learn some cool things together. So for this first tutorial, um, I needed some screen recording software. So I did a search across the internet, looked at Chrome extensions, looked at YouTube Live. Nothing seemed very easy to use. YouTube Live doesn't let you just record your screen anymore. You have to like download some extra software to do it. I kind of want to avoid that. And all the Chrome extensions, I just wanted to, you to sign up for their accounts or they have like free versions that are limited and you have to pay to do more than a few videos or there were just bugs in them. So I decided why not just create my own screen recording software. And it took like, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes and the, I'm using the screen recording prototype that I made to record this tutorial right now. So let's do our best. It might be loud. I have family around. Also, this isn't the, uh, what am I trying to say? I don't have the best equipment necessarily, but you know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So here we go. Okay, first step when we're building anything, we need to create a repository. Um, I'm not exactly sure who the target audience of these tutorials is going to be right now. So I guess I'm going to try to explain. I'll assume, you, hmm, you know, I don't know. I don't know who the target audience is exactly, but I know that you're not going to be experts in web development. So I'll, I'll just do my best and you can give me feedback to see what we can do in future tutorials. So first thing we need to do is to create a repository. I really like using GitHub. Some people like to use Bitbucket or GitLab or potentially another service. Honestly, I don't understand why you would use Bitbucket or GitLab when you have GitHub pretty much everybody is using github has the most network effects i think it's the best personally so that's what i use okay so what are we going to call this uh, so we need a new name i use screen recorder for the last repository so let's call it something else let's call it screen quarter prototype that's good enough I like to put a readme in um, that will just initialize a blank readme, which is just nice because then I can go in and add the full readme later. I like the MIT license personally. It's widely used and uh, it's uh, very simple and very liberal in what people can do with it. I'm not going to do any of this marketplace stuff right now. So I'm going to create my repository. Okay, here it is. I first thing I need to do is to get it onto my local machine. So I'm gonna open up a terminal. I like to store everything in a folder that I call development. This has all of my latest repositories that I've been working on essentially. So I'm gonna add one more. Okay, so I just cloned. So I used the command git clone, and I put in the URL to my repository on GitHub. So what that did is it essentially created a directory right here called screen recorder prototype. And that's where my new initialized repository is. You could also create the repository on your local machine first using git commands. And then you could upload it to GitHub later. I prefer creating in GitHub first usually, and then cloning it down, just because I don't know it's easier, in my opinion. It does more things for you. Okay, so usually I like to type I like to type git status quite a bit. It just kind of tells me what branch I'm on, tells me if there's any files that have uh, not been committed yet, it tells me what changes are up, stuff like that. So. And I just did the ls command, which lists everything in this directory. As you can see, all I have is a license and a readme right now. Awesome. So let's open up our text editor. 
I prefer to use Visual Studio Code. Oh, that's the old project. Close that for now. Okay, here's a blank project. Uh, like I said, I like to use Visual Studio Code. Other people might use Atom or Sublime or something. Personally, I used to use Atom. It was pretty awesome. Uh, but Visual Studio Code is a little more awesome in my opinion. Um, and it's just a simple text editor. It gives you syntax highlighting and it gives you some features on top. So it can give you, if you're using TypeScript, it'll give you code completion and um, it, it will give you type checking right within your browser, some static analysis and stuff like that. So I like it. I prefer to stay away from things that are heavy on the GUI side. So integrated development environments like Visual Studio proper, the actual Visual Studio project, or Eclipse or JetBeans or any of those things, I would stay clear from just because I feel like they get in your, in your way with all of their GUI menus and they kind of hide complexity in a way that is not very simple. So three things that I, you always have open. I have my web browser open. I have my text editor open and I have my terminal open. When you're building a web application, usually that's all you need. So let's go here and let's open our project, the screen recorder prototype. Okay, here it is. Here's our stuff, that's awesome. Like I said, here's the license and here's the readme. Right now it's blank, I'll go in later probably or never and update that. Okay, so when you're building a web application, you always start usually by convention, the entry point is the index.html file. Boom, here it is, a blank index.html file. Put this incantation at the top, the doc type HTML. That's just what you have to do. Let me zoom in just in case this is not big enough for you guys. Hopefully that's good enough. Okay. Then we have an opening HTML tag and a closing HTML tag. We'll put a head in and a body. Usually that starts everything off. I like to put in a title element, the screen quarter prototype. That will change the tab. So well, I'll show you. And the body, I don't know. Let's just put a simple a header element, screen recorder prototype. Okay, so that's actually good for now. Let's take a look. So what you can do is without running any kind of web server or anything, you can actually execute or load this HTML file into the browser from the file system and it should, should display it for you. So easiest way to do this is to just navigate to your project where is it? And open it up in the browser. So, so boom, here we go. Okay, here we go. Screen recorder prototype. Now I always open my dev tools. Uh, and I'm using Arch Linux, so I can hit the F12 button within a tab. That will open my dev tools for me. Or you can right click and click inspect. That usually opens up this elements tab. But this gives you your browser console, lets you see all your sources and the network tab, which is very important and some other really nice things as well. So I usually just leave the console open here. One other thing I believe you should do, I highly recommend it, is to click the disable cache button here. This will disable the cache when the DevTools is open. Sometimes your HTML cache is gonna cause your page not to change, not to upload um, immediately after your changes. So when you're developing, it's nice to turn off that cache so you don't get confused. Okay, so our screen recorder prototype is right here, awesome. Why is there so much stuff here? It's fine, it's fine. Okay, so first things first, uh, let me explain a little bit how I like to go about prototyping things. So this is just a prototype. What usually when I'm developing an application, if I haven't done it before, I will, um, I will start to prototype by just getting it to work. I subscribe to the philosophy, I don't remember who created it or who made it up, 
but essentially it has three steps. Make it work, make it work well, make it work fast. And there's kind of a, a few variations of that that you could think of when we're creating these types of applications. But right now we're gonna focus on getting this prototype to work. What that means is the code might be ugly. It might be a little bit unmaintainable. We're gonna, in the beginning, we're gonna take on technical debt. Technical debt means essentially you're gonna make choices in your code that will make it difficult for you to scale the project and to maintain it currently in exchange for being able to move quickly right now. So eventually if we were to continue with this project, we would have to pay back the technical debt because once things get unwieldy enough, um, it's gonna start affecting you and you're going to have to address how poorly you wrote the code. But when you're prototyping, I say take on as much technical debt as you can just to get it to work if you don't, if you don't know how to get it to work yet. And we'll see how far this tutorial goes, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to work well. It'll be kind of ugly code, and I'll try to explain the design choices I'm making. But over time, we can, once it does work, we can decide to clean up the code and make it look nicer. So that's just on the code maintainability portion. Also, how the app actually looks, what I propose as a good way to develop is Make it look, make it, again, make it work and make it work well. Making it work well, I would say that's when you want to add in your styles and other UX features that aren't the main, um, the main UX features. Like your app should be usable from the beginning. The prototype has to, I mean, has to work, otherwise it doesn't work, right? Once it does work, you can clean up the code, which I would say also includes adding in more beautiful CSS, making the UX, you know, beautiful, smooth, make it feel comfortable and inviting when the user comes. I feel like those kinds of design choices and design implementation should come after your prototype. So right now, we're just gonna make everything bare bones, try to get to work and not worry too much about how everything's structured. So let's do it. Okay, first thing we're gonna need is a button that says start recording. Kind of makes sense, right? So I'm thinking of the high level UX pieces. What is What are the very basic components that I need to get this app to work? So we need to start recording and we need to stop recording. So let's just do that for now, let's go look at it. Okay, sweet, we got two buttons, start and stop. That's easy. Okay, so when we click start, it's always gonna prompt us to uh, record our screen. And it, it might need permissions also for our audio on the first try. And then it should start actually recording. And when you click stop recording, we want to cut all the streams off and allow us to download the video. And these will be WebM videos, by the way. That's the, the web's native video format. Okay, so yeah, just to make this happen really fast, I'm gonna just throw a script tag in right here, okay? So, um, let's add a couple functions in here. We'll add a start recording function. Notice I'm making it asynchronous. The reason that I'm doing that is that I might have asynchronous code in here. So code that uses promises essentially. And I would really like to use the async await syntax to deal with those promises. So asynchronous code in JavaScript, traditionally a long time ago in the beginning, you, you handled your asynchronous code with callbacks. So essentially you would pass a function in to another function as a parameter if that function was asynchronous. And when that function completed its asynchronous task, it would call your callback and then your execution can flow from there. That is kind of difficult to deal with for many reasons. So uh, they added promises and promises allow you to deal with asynchronous code in a slightly better manner because you can chain them together. So at least visually and I guess logically, you can follow a promise chain straight down. 
async await is kind of the next iteration of improvements to asynchronous code. And essentially, async await lets you write code as if it's synchronous, so you don't have to change the way you, that you think about it really when you're writing it, but it's still asynchronous under the hood, so it's really nice. So I'm just making these async by default. Okay, so yeah, we've got two functions, start recording and stop recording. So uh, there's a couple ways. So, all right, so we need to hook these functions up. So when we're prototyping, sometimes I just like to log things. So when the start recording functions run, it's just gonna log that for us. And same thing with the stop recording function. So. A quick and simple way to do this is just to add an on-click listener right here, or um, attribute. And we'll just call start recording right there. Let's test it out. Doesn't work. Refresh. There we go. OK, so we hooked that button up. Notice it's, it's uh, logging right there. So essentially, we could just do the same thing right here. Stop, start, stop, start, stop. Okay, so we've got our uh, event handlers hooked up to the elements that are, are going to emit those events. So that's good. So that's cool. Now, when we start recording, there's a couple things that we need to do. So we need to grab, first we, we want to make sure that we can record audio. So we're going to get an audio stream. So this is where we're going to start using the browser's built-in APIs that allow us to do this kind of stuff. So this is a promise that we're going to use. So, so window.navigator.mediadevices.getUserMedia, and we're going to pass in uh, an option called audio. OK, so let me explain what just happened here. Essentially, we are going to grab a stream, an audio stream from the browser. So the browser gives you many APIs, many of them through this global window object. So the window object is just a global variable, essentially, that is available anywhere. So if you type window into the console, boom, here it is. Has a ton of stuff that you can use by default. So that's really nice. That's, I believe that is the main mechanism through which we access the browser APIs. So that window global object has a navigator object on it. The navigator has a media devices object on it, and it has a get user media function. Media devices has a get user media function on it. And if you pass in the audio, if you pass in an object with an audio property of true, that's going to prompt the browser to grab an audio stream for us. And there are many things we can do with an audio stream, but we are going to record that audio stream. So. We'll just, we'll just leave it there for now. Okay, we also want to get a video stream. But we don't want to record from the user's webcam. We want to record um, the screen. So remember, Google is your best friend. JavaScript, record, oops. Record screen capture. Let's take a look at what this API is, because I forgot. There it is, get display media. Okay, so that should uh, prompt the browser to ask us for permission to record either our entire screen or a tab or something, and we'll return the video stream right here. It's pretty cool. Um, it would be nice to test this. So, okay. Here I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. Let's just make sure that we can get this audio stream correctly. So I'll just log it. Okay. So we'll refresh. Okay. So notice that it's prompting me for my for permissions to use the microphone, which is perfect. That's what we wanted to do. I will allow. Okay. Notice that we got the audio stream because it's logged right here. So perfect. We got the audio stream. Now let's do the same thing for the video stream. So I just like to do some intelligent logging here. 
Okay, so start. Okay, it wants permission to use the microphone again. Oh, okay, I don't think we refreshed it. So let's do that again. Okay, permission to use the microphone. Okay, now it's asking for permission to do one of the things. So apparently we can record just the tab. We can record another applications window, interesting, or the entire screen. I would like to do the entire screen. So I'll share it, bam. Oh, <laughs> so it's, it's sharing my screen right now. And notice we've logged the audio stream and the video stream. So I'm gonna stop sharing and refresh. Okay, looks like that's work, all working just fine. So let's get rid of these logs. By the way, a quick note on logging, or debugging, I suppose. So, uh, sometimes using a debugger is nice. You can set breakpoints, which, yeah, Chrome will let you do. So, you know, I might want to put a breakpoint in something like this. Um, but, uh, like, it's I, I use that kind of debugging some of the time. But mostly, I think if you use intelligent logging, I feel like, you can actually debug things much quicker because you can uh, you can watch the flow of your entire application if you put logs at the correct points. <clears throat> Excuse me. Instead of when you're debugging, it just seems kind of slow and you have to catch things at the right time. And I would say try to use logging as much as possible when you're debugging. It really helps. Okay, so we've got these two streams. So what we need to do is combine these into a final stream because Oops. Um, we're going to want to record the audio and the video together. So the web lets you do this really nicely. So essentially what we need to do is we need to get all of the audio tracks from this audio stream, and we're going to spread them out into this array. And we're going to do the exact same thing for the video stream. Okay. So now we have created in final stream that is going to essentially be the combined stream from all the tracks from our audio stream and all the tracks from our video stream. We're going to combine them together into one final stream. That is what we're going to pass into our media recorder. So we will pass this final stream into this media recorder. Okay, nice, cool. Notice I'm grouping these things together. These are all streams. so. I feel like it's nice visually to just group them together. You can come up with your own heuristics for how that works. Uh, yep, now I have this recorder here. And what we do to start the recording process is we just say start. Okay, that's how I do it. Um, yeah, so that's cool, right? But we need to when we stop the recording, we need to get the data that we recorded. So what we do is we're going to add an event listener. So this recorder object that we've created here, when it stops, it's going to raise an event. That event's name is data available, I believe. Let's double check that. Media recorder data available. Pretty sure, yeah, looks like it's correct. Data available event. Okay. That's going to give us an event right there, and we will just log that event when we're done. Uh, so, so, so check this out. Let's make sure that everybody's on the same page here. We get grab our audio stream from the browser. We grab our video stream from the browser. We combine them into one stream so that we will be able to record both audio and video. Then we create our actual recorder. Then we say we add a function, an event listener, onto the recorder for the data available event. That event fires when the recorder stops recording. Okay. Then after we hook that up, we call recorder.start. Now notice that our stop recording function here isn't doing anything. So what we want to do is say recorder.stop right here. But now notice this. Uh, recorder inside of this function, recorder right here, was never defined. There is no variable called recorder, so this will fail. So for right now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make recorder a variable that is global, essentially, so that both of these functions have access to it. Okay. Remember, this is just prototyping. 
I'm just trying to do this as fast as possible. I probably, I, w I would not do this in, you know, a final polished product that I'm going to keep maintaining. So instead of, so see how recorder right here is a local variable. I'm going to make it a global variable by getting rid of the const uh, variable declarator right there. Okay, so the recorder is now global. So this should all work. Get rid of that. Let's refresh. Okay, we refreshed. Okay, start recording. Allow the microphone there. Share my entire screen. Okay, this looks good. Now we stop. Okay, I think that kind of worked. No, I think it totally worked. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, so notice this. So this is the event th that um, is fired. This is the data available event object. So here's all the stuff. This data property has the blob that is our WebM video. So that is actually pretty cool. Okay, so we're getting close here. So notice that when I click stop, the video stream didn't stop. And I assume the audio stream didn't either. So I had to refresh to get it to actually, to get those streams to go away. So we want to clean up those streams. So what we're going to do is actually this final stream, we need access to it as well. So let's make the final stream global variable as well. And right here, I'm gonna get the final streams tracks. I'm gonna iterate through each of them. And each of these tracks has a function on them called stop, I believe. We'll see if it actually works. That should stop all the streams. So we'll we'll stop the recorder right here. And then our final stream, we're gonna stop all the audio and all the video streams that we use to combine into that final stream. And that should stop everything nicely and clean it all up. So we'll start recording. And we'll stop recording. Perfect. See that notice how that bar at the bottom disappeared. And now our blob has uh, we logged our blob. That's pretty cool. Okay, there's another step here. Uh, we want to download this video file, right? So there's a nice way to do this. Uh, essentially, we are going to create an anchor tag, so a, a link element. We'll use the document dot create element API to create a essentially an empty anchor tag. So there it is. It's just in memory. It's not attached to the document yet, so it's not really going to do anything. So we're going to set some attributes here. So we're going to programmatically set the href attribute to be. Oh, window dot url dot create object url e dot data okay so what this does is essentially we are creating what well, we are creating is what's what is called an object url from the blob so e dot data is the blob essentially it's just bytes that's the bytes that are our video and we're going to create an object url essentially this is a url that the browser is going to store for us and it gives us a really nice to use string back and we're going to set that as the href attribute on this link element. We're also going to set the download attribute on this link element. And we're going to create a name for our video. I like to just use, you know, um, just so that every single video is different, we'll just, we'll just serialize a date and set that as a name. And we know that they are going to be .webm files. So this download attribute will We'll create that name for us so we can download it. Uh, OK, then here's what we're going to do. We're going to add the link to the body. So now it's in the document. We're going to click the link. And then we're going to remove the link again. OK, does that hopefully that all made sense? Let me go over it one more time we create an anchor tag, an, a link element in memory by using the browser's document.create element. Now remember how I said everything is from window? This is actually window.document. So that's how we're accessing this browser API. So window.document.create element, we have our, our link element in memory. We're gonna programmatically set the href attribute to a 
an object URL, which is essentially the raw video data that the data available event returned to us. We're going to set the download attribute and put a name on, on the file, append it to the document, programmatically click it, and then remove that link from the document so that it gets cleaned up. So let's refresh this. OK, start recording. Give it all the permissions again. OK, everything's recording really nicely. Now let's stop. Up, oh, something broke. All right, I, I think I might have to come do this video later just because I have to go. So we'll do it later. OK, I'm back. I said I wouldn't do any editing, but I'll probably do a little bit of editing because that'll probably make it way nicer. OK, so let's get back into what we're doing. OK, so oh yes, we're trying to download our file. So let's see what happened here. Failed to execute a pen child on node, only one element on document allowed. So what I did was a mistake. I need to add this to the body and remove it from the body. The document is not an element necessarily, <clears throat> but the body is. So let's refresh and try this again. Okay, allow, share. We're now recording and stop. Boom. That's cool. Uh, OK, let's save it to my desktop. I um, guess I'll save it here. Save. OK, let's open it up and see if it worked. Share. Woo! We're now recording. And it's, it worked. That's awesome. OK, well, that's pretty much everything. So all right, so that's simple, right? We have a start. We have a stop. And we can download our video once we're done. So that's that's the prototype. All that's done. So I'm going to clean up just a little bit. Get rid of that. Oops. Get rid of that. OK, cool. Now, it's. I mean, it's cool that we can do it from our file system here. And if you want to leave it like that, that's totally fine. But it would be nice to deploy this. Right, so that we can actually, you know, have it on the web available. So let's go through the steps to do that. Uh, first off, so let's go look at our changes in Git. This entire file is new, so Git status. So it hasn't been added yet. So I'm going to add that file. Git add dash dash all is how I like to do it. Just adds everything. Git status to check what we're doing. So we've got the new index.html file. Let's commit. Usually I'll say initial commit if it's the first commit. OK. And there we go. We need to now push that to master to get it up on GitHub. That's where I have to type in my passphrase for my SSH key because I'm using SSH so that I don't have to put in my username and my password every time. I just have my SSH keys to it. And you can set that up on GitHub. All right, so that has been pushed. So if we go on GitHub and look at this, let's refresh. There we are. Here's our index.html file. A simple way. So there are two ways that I would recommend. If you're just kind of prototyping and you want to show show something off, you know, quickly, I would use GitHub pages. So if I just you can just go to this. So I just went to the settings in my repository, scroll down to GitHub pages, and I'm going to say master branch. That means it will use whatever's on the master branch to deploy. And because we wrote everything in an index.html file, that's what GitHub is going to use as, as the main uh, source. OK, so that's now getting it ready. If you look, they've given me a nice URL here, site not found. So what you usually have to do is after you enable GitHub pages, you need to go do one more commit. So I'm just going to do a commit in here. I'll just get rid of some spacing just so I can commit something. OK, now that should make GitHub 
deploy the site essentially. So let's refresh. There it is. Okay, so now this is live. This is a URL that you can literally go to right now. Pretty cool, right? Pretty cool. Now, what I suggest you do for a production application, I suggest that you use Netlify. I really like this company. The stuff they do works very well. Their customer service is relatively good, if I remember correctly. And I love their philosophy for web application development. They're, I believe they're the creators of the Jam Stack. The Jam Stack is not soft, a software library or framework. Um, essentially, it's a paradigm, and it stands for JavaScript APIs and markup. Essentially, it's the single page application paradigm where you push everything to the client as much as possible, and then you interact with any other services that you need, be it a database or a third-party API, anything like that you do through APIs from the client. So that would usually be HTTP requests or maybe something over WebSockets or WebRTC, something like that. So yeah, build single page applications, which essentially are just markup, so HTML files, maybe some CSS files, and JavaScript or TypeScript, right? So you'll have all those, and those are all, we call those static assets because it's just source code. It's it's not dynamic. The code itself is not dynamic, as in this source code that I've written. It's going to stay like this when I deploy it to production, essentially. And what's nice about static assets, if you can build your app out of static assets, is that you can take those static assets and you can deploy them to a CDN. That's a content delivery network. And a CDN is essentially a worldwide set of servers, so a set of computers that will host your static assets for you. So you don't really need to worry about configuring these servers or renting them on AWS or you know, wherever you would do stuff like that. These servers are managed for you and all you have to think about as developer is your source code. And you give your source code to the CDN and the CDN is gonna make sure that your static assets get delivered throughout the world. So if I'm in California, where I am right now, and I push up my code to a CDN, someone in Japan would be served, hopefully, from a server that's closer to Japan. Someone in England is going to be served from a server that's closer to England. If I were on AWS, I only have a few regions to choose from, right? I could host things on maybe Oregon servers, GitHub pages. I don't believe it's a CDN. I believe you know, they have some kind of static hosting of, of their own. And it's going to be served essentially from one location. Again, I'm not certain on if GitHub Pages uses a CDN or not. I think it, I think it doesn't. But you know, that's something I want to look up. So I'm going to look that up. Um, yeah, but Netlify is a CDN, and so it's going to try to put your code on servers that are closer to people, which is really nice for <clears throat> performance. At least getting to that first, <clears throat> getting the user to to that first interaction with your application. So I'm going to log in to Netlify here. This is my account. So I'm going to create a new site from Git. Remember, you don't have to do this, but for a real production website, I highly recommend using a CDN. And if you're going to use a CDN, I highly recommend using Netlify. And remember, this is only for the static assets. So any any APIs that I need that aren't already hosted somewhere else, so anything that's not a third-party API. So if I have a database that I need to save data to, Netlify isn't necessarily going to do that for me. I would have to probably, what I would recommend is go to AWS, use RDS, you know, get a MySQL or Postgres. I recommend Postgres database setup, and I would put GraphQL in front of that, and then I would interact with the GraphQL API. But we don't have any APIs necessary for this besides the web APIs that are all located client side in the browser. So using a CDN is the perfect place to host our front end static assets. All right, so I need to search screen recorder prototype. OK, 
Okay, it is not yet configured, so I'm going to click this configure button. I'm going to use my last MJS account. You can't see this password, hopefully. Okay, and let's go screen recorder prototype. Perfect. Yep, so I added that so that Netlify can access it. Okay, and it's kind of the same as GitHub Pages now, very similar. I'm going to deploy to the master branch, and I don't have any other build settings right now. Very simple. Okay, so it's now deploying, as you can see right here. Should really only take, there, it's done. Okay, so here's the crazy URL that they give me. Oh, what do you know? So this is live on the internet. Let's just see if it works real quick. Yes. Okay, I'm now recording. Stop recording. Okay, so I could download the file, but I'm not going to. All right, it'd be nice to change this name to something, you know, better. So instead of this crazy random string, let's do screen recorder prototype .net com. Oh, shoot, someone took it. Uh, oh, actually, I took it. I have another project with the same name. All right, well, you know what? I'm just going to add a one to it for now, just to be fast. But you know, you you get it. You could you could change this name to anything. .netlify.com. <clears throat> also, if you want to get really serious, you can buy a domain name either with Netlify or on another um, registrar's website, and you can hook up that domain name into Netlify. And I'll probably show that in a different tutorial. But yeah, so this is now live, and you could use <coughs> this URL or the GitHub Pages URL. And this one is on a CDN, gets all the benefits of a CDN. So that is, I guess, step one of this tutorial. We just prototype this out. I think that's good for uh, an initial look at this. And thanks for watching. If you have any questions, just let me know.